Okay, hi everybody. Uh, it's the Leadership Boot Camp. It's the Fort Chip session. This is Catalyst for Responsibility. We're all gathered here at Keanu College. You're sitting there in your pajamas. Cover up, please. Thank you. And uh, we'll get started. Good after, good evening. Good evening. That was crappy. Good evening. Good evening. And uh, everyone thank Doreen and uh, the rest of the team for supper. Right? You setting it up for us. Now, one of our participants, it is your last night with us. Is that right? Tell everybody what you're doing. I don't think everybody knows what you're doing after tonight. Well, I mean, in the coming days. Yeah, yeah. So it's school year is wrapping up. Now, will you be back? Awesome. And when do you come back? End of August. End of August. So all of the, everything that's always set up here for us, everything that's organized, the technology, everything, is because she puts it all together for us, right? So a round of applause. We appreciate that. That's right. Okay. Should we talk to Maxine? You can start there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Whatever. Yeah, what happened to talk to Maxine? Well, how about this? You guys figure it out offline. Just make sure I know so when we send out the... Get the right place. Well, yeah, so I get the right place, but also we'll include it in the, um, in the reminder. Okay, the last three weeks, we had in-depth conversations about systems and that to be an effective leader today, you had to be great at systems. And whether that system was maximizing utilization of your time or, and maybe some of you access this, maybe you didn't, whether that system was effective delegation or effective motivation or effective communication, systems, that it was about systems, or how to create an innovative idea. So I threw a lot of systems at you. Did anybody go in and look at some of the other systems that we didn't necessarily talk about, but that I posted videos on? Did anybody look at those? You watched the videos. Okay, very good. So somebody tell me something you took away from the last three weeks. What did you take from the last three weeks of our time? What learning did you take in the last three weeks? Come on. Something you took away from our last three weeks. I learned to delegate more. Did you? Yeah, and for me that was tough, but then I decided, well, I'm going to attempt it. No, no thought about it. And how's that going? Oh my God, I got lots more delegated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Really? It was an eye opener, yeah, because I mean, I was doing a lot more stuff I didn't have to be, stressing out myself when I didn't need to be. Right. Because, you know, my assistant could do a lot more than, you know, when I first started, she's only been there a couple of months. Right. And I just asked her if it would be like the meetings we just asked to have, you know, if you give me a, you know, idea of what you can handle and if you can, mm -hmm. what's possible. That's great. That's awesome. Two things. One, thank you for actually trying something that we're talking about. That's huge. And two, thank you for sharing it. But, but also that you're having success. Right? That's awesome. Well done. Somebody else. Something that you're taking away. How about time? We had an in-depth conversation about time, right? Are any of you doing the exercise that I asked you to do on Monday? What was the exercise? Anybody remember? Make it. Yeah. Are you tracking your time right now? You're only two days in, but are you starting to see anything after just tracking one, day, one and a half days? Anybody? You need to be more than one person? Yeah. So on Friday, if you, if you, haven't, if you haven't started to do that exercise, I'd encourage you to do it. The point of the exercise is we took a week and talked about the concepts of time and maximizing its use. Then we wanted to take a week and track how it is now. 
not truly utilizing the concepts, just how are you, how, how does your time flow now? On Friday, I'll send you an email, and in that email, I'll have an explanation of what that matrix means and some tips. And then the following week, next week, I want you to do what was advised. You sit down, we utilize the time blocking techniques, we put in the high leverage activities first, we put in our assumptive activities, deadlines and the like, and then we create our action list for the week, not for the day, and then I want you to see how that week turns out. And what I've already heard, not necessarily from participants here, but participants in the Fort McMurray evening, Wednesday evening program, <clears throat> that are already attempting it. They're already picking up time. My goal for you would be, can you squeeze out four hours a week? Can you pick out four hours in your week? And is that four hours that could be used with your family, four hours that could be used in your own personal wellness and health or mental health, four hours that can be used in your workplace? If you could squeeze out four hours. Now, what's really four hours? Well, if there's 168 hours in a week, four hours is really only, well, it's not even, it's a point four, it's five, it was four percent, right? Four percent. So f it's four percent. Can you pick up 4% of efficiency? So I'm not proposing that you pick up 10 hours in your week. Just 4% of efficiency by proactively utilizing some of the tools that we're talking about. And most importantly for me, I know it will make your, men your mental health better and you'll have more time with your kids. Or you'll have more time with your spouse. Or you'll have more time. Is time controlling you or are you controlling your time? Now, does that eliminate days where you're just obliterated? In other words, the, the day just goes crazy and you lose, you completely lost your schedule, crisis management. No, it doesn't eliminate those days. That's just not going to get eliminated. But you will mitigate that. And the next day, you'll be able to get more easily back on track because you had a plan for your week. And remember, my week is aligned with my month, which is aligned with my quarter, which is aligned with my year, which is aligned with my life. So my long-term plan is aligned with this next hour. And over a period of time, it just becomes a part of that 80% of your unconscious behavior. So if you didn't have an opportunity, because you didn't have time to go in and really digest that information, it's all there. Watch that half-hour training video, which frankly is good, not just because we did it, it is good. And then watch those successive pieces of information to get, to hone those skills. And remember, a big difference between managing your time and maximizing the utilization of your time. And can anybody remember, what, what, why is that different? Why is maximizing the use of your time and time management two different things? What's the difference? Maximizing the use of your time, time management. Who remember, what, what's the difference? Come on. What's the difference between the two? So the difference is when I manage my time, that's about to-do lists, that's about time blocking, that's about appointments, that's about schedule. Maximizing the utilization of my time is about having long-term, long-range goals in each one of the roles of my life, picking out the activities that give me the greatest return or the activities that give me the lowest, and then proactively taking those high return activities and making sure I'm doing them every week. Which, in, which increases the likelihood of me getting where I want to go. So as a mid-level manager of any organization, the number one activity I probably can be doing is spending time with my people. And whether that's individually spending time with my people or spending time with my people as a group. But what's the thing, you talk to any mid-level manager or director, what's the thing they always go home saying? Damn, I gotta get, I gotta make an, I gotta spend some more time with my people. Damn, I didn't spend any time with my people this week. Gosh, I'm neglecting my people. So we're doing so much busyness, but we're not investing, planting seeds in the most important asset we have as a mid level leader or a director level my people. That's why that high leverage activity has to be the first thing we put into our next week's schedule. It has to be the first thing I block out next Wednesday because it's gonna give me the highest return on my 
my time spent. And just remember the visual. There's some activities that when done provide you a greater return than the time invested. There's other activities that when done provide you less, I'm sorry, provide you less return than the time invested. Remember Pareto's law, high return activities, low return activities. Pareto says that 80% of the results come from 20% of the activities. It's in my best interest to identify those activities and then make sure those activities get on my schedule every week. So Joanne probably has some very specific activities that when she does them, it gives her a greater return. Probably one of those activities is meeting with your executive leaders, right? Spending time and understanding Glenn and Brian's vision and direction. And then probably another one of your high leverage activities is then taking that vision and direction and making sure your people know what it is. But in the busyness of life, those meetings oftentimes don't happen. And if they don't happen over and over and over and over again, there's a lack of alignment between vision and direction and daily operation. So for you in your role, and I don't know your role completely, but I know you're a manager, right, of housing. So you have people that report to you. You probably get vision and direction from a board. So you get vision and direction from a board. So somehow you've got to regularly, probably on a weekly basis, you should set aside time to take that vision and direction and make sure that your people, you okay? Who has some water? Anybody have water? Or you've got to... You sure? Yeah, as long as you can talk, then I'm, I feel okay. So, so for you, that vision of the direction of the board translated to your people is key. The problem is you don't have time to have that meeting because you're dealing with fires, fires, crisis, fires, crisis, fires, crisis. So that high leverage activity has got to get in your schedule. So here's your schedule. And remember, the first thing, we talk about the first thing you plan is those high leverage activities. So you're going to block that out. High leverage activity, high leverage activity, high leverage activity. And if you recall, the principle was making an appointment with myself. I probably won't blow off an appointment with him, but I routinely blow off appointments with myself. Oh, I, need a, I know I need to do this today. And then you get to the end of the day and, damn, why didn't I do that? By putting it physically in your schedule and making an appointment with yourself, you you will probably be more likely to do it. Even if the thing you want to do is more organic and spontaneous. I need to go walk past this group of people today. I should go check on them. Put it in your calendar. Yeah, but that's hyper-organized, Ian. If I don't put it in my calendar, I guarantee it won't happen. So some of these principles, I encourage you, if you didn't take the time or you, couldn't have, you didn't have the time to watch the videos, to go through it, go back and go through it. How long is this information available to you? Forever. forever. So you have this forever. That means the Boot Camp One participants can go in today and still access that information. Access in our, in our commitment, our commitment, RMWB's commitment, is this information will always be available to you. So. For you, your employees, you should have them go through the videos. You should use it to grow them. In the community, use it to grow youth and kids and other organizations. Hey, I've got these training videos. I can, you know, you're sitting in a meeting, let's say, and somebody says, well, we need to bring in a facilitator to help with uh, us all getting to know each other. And you can raise your hand and say, well, wait a minute, I got a video where we can do this leadership style thing. It's a lot of fun. I got it. We can access it next, next meeting. So these tools are available for you to use. They don't do us any good if the only people that see them are you. Does that make sense? So please access them. All right, anything else that you took away from, our, from the last three weeks? Anything else that you gained from the last three weeks? Any other observations, thoughts? Okay, one thing. At the beginning of the last three weeks, we asked you to pick out your one thing. Many of you have, and that's good. Some of you have not. You can expect that if you haven't given me your one thing, that Wednesday of next week, by Wednesday of next week, I'm going to send you a note. 
And it'll just be a gentle nudge to say, hey, 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 you haven't picked your one thing that you want to get better at. And for our guests that are joining us today, you know, the whole point of this program is performance improvement. So pick out one thing, try to get better at it. If you haven't picked out one thing, remember we only got nine weeks left. And we're, we're coming up on halfway on this thing. Actually a little bit less than that, we got six weeks left. So we only got six weeks left. So pick out your one thing. Now's the time to pick it out and then we'll focus on it for a six week period of time. Okay, so tonight, tonight we start a new competency. And this, this competency has a historical reference. So we gotta take a little historical journey. We're all community builders, let's say, right? We wanna be community builders. We wanna be people that can bring together others with different talents and experience and interests and background. How do we bring together others and get them to go in, a, in the common direction? So somehow, all of you as community builders, And you've seen this diagram before. Community. And the community says it wants to go this way. It wants to be a thriving community. It wants to be a prosperous community. It wants to be a safe community. It wants to be a healthy community in all senses of the word. But usually within that, you have this going on. You okay? I did Good job. Because you were close. Don't make us all feel guilty. <laughs> Would you agree with me this is many communities? And whether the community is a, a municipality or a, 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 a town or it's just a neighborhood. So somehow me as a community builder, without any authority, without any money, without any levers or levers over you, Somehow I got to get you on board. Somehow I've got to get you to want to give some time, talent, and treasure. Somehow I've got to get you to want to participate in community. Would you agree with me that has become more and more challenging over the years? In any town. Why? Why has it become so hard to get people involved? Back here to now today. 2013, why is it so hard to get people involved in 2013? Even in a rural community. Busyness, why else? And this is really important to understand. If we're gonna do anything in a community, we have to understand this shift that's occurred. And what's in it for them? Okay, what's in it for them? Most popular radio station in the world, please write it down, W-I-F-M is the most popular radio station in the world. What's in it for me? The most popular, that's what everybody will listen to right there. Yeah. Most popular radio station in the world. What's in it for me? So, what do you think changed? Why is it so hard for people to get involved? What changed? Over the last 100 years or more, even the last 25 years, what changed? Okay. Don't rely on each other. Mm. No way. Even my generation, and certainly my parents' generation, in order to get things done, uh -huh. they didn't have the resources. There wasn't the money. Mm -hmm. People's personal wealth wasn't what it is today. Well, I'm not from a prairie, but take a barn, barn raising as an example. Mm -hmm. Today. Today. Yeah. So, let's walk out this historical precedent. And whether you're doing community policing, or whether you're running the housing, or whether you're trying to run the nonprofit, or whether you're trying to engage people through the municipality, the principles are the same. This historical shift is critical if you're going to lead a community. How many ever years ago? A thousand or a hundred, it doesn't matter. Community participation was obligatory. So write that down, obligatory, obligatory, I don't know how to spell it, obligatory, I don't even know if it's a word actually. It was an obligation. For me 
to live in an area or live in a town, I was obligated to participate. Why was I obligated to participate? What would happen if I didn't participate? You were no. You were shunned, and you would what? Die. Nobody would help you. You would die. You would just absolutely not make it. Well, I can make it on my own. I would go to the store and shop. No, you would not go to the store and shop. There was some kind of, there was some kind of social safety net to help me. No, there was no social safety. You needed other people to make it. Obligatory. So whether it was the barn raising, whether it was defending myself against the elements, obligatory. For thousands of years, community participation was obligatory. Then there was a shift. We started getting more civilized. And we started having governments around us. But frankly, it's just been in since the turn of the century that government started to take on roles that normally the community did. If we wanted a, a place, <coughs> uh, it's contagious. <coughs> if we wanted a place of faith, any kind of place of faith, 50 years ago, who built the place of faith? The people. If we wanted a park or a ball field 50 years ago, who built it? Who funded it? Today, neighborhoods say what? Build me a playground. Or are you with RMWB? Oh, could you do me a favor? Build me a playground. Oh, are you with RMWB? I don't have good enough assets in my community. Will you build me something, please? We'll come and show up to the public meeting, tell you what to do, but then you go get the money and, and you build it for me. There's been a fundamental shift from obligatory community participation to prove to me your thing is worth my time, my talent, and my treasure. Do you find yourself having to prove to people that participation in community is important? People, how many ever years ago, would laugh at that? Because they would say, well, it's obvious. It's not obvious to people anymore. Most of our community-based organizations, including our governmental entities, are working off of strategies that are based in obligatory participation. Their recruitment or engagement strategies sound something like this. Well, but don't you know it's good for the community? You need to help. It's good for you and it's good for the community. They are assuming that you would say, oh, I have an obligation to help. Not anymore. They look at you and go like this. Well, why the hell should I help? Yeah, what, what, what is it going to do for me? Agreed. Totally agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. And because we talked about that six weeks ago, that truism carries forward to this same point. I don't trust my institutions of government. I don't trust my institutions of faith. I don't trust my nonprofit institutions. I don't trust the people who live around me. The, the trust quotient is lower than I've ever seen it in my lifetime in our society. But I still need to be able to recruit volunteers. I still need to be able to people, get people to clean up their front yard. I still need to be able to get people to get along and be civil to one another. I still need to be able to build a community. And remember, a community is not a group of people that just live near one another and share the buying and selling and consuming of goods together. That's not a community. So how do we take this fundamental shift and actually use it to our advantage? How do we take people who feel like, prove it to me, prove me that getting involved in your nonprofit or in your community organization or volunteering, prove to me that your thing is worth my time. How do we actually leverage that? Well, you've got to take a second piece into consideration that I think is true today. I think today's people are desperately looking for meaning. I think people are desperately looking for something of meaning to be a part of. I think people are desperately looking for something that's authentic. I'll use this Ghana project as an example. We're taking, so we're taking all these, there's a bunch of people going to Ghana. RMWB gave my organization, Let Them Be Kids, a playground. That playground has now been refurbished. It, along with two other playgrounds, is going to Ghana. So the garbage of North America is becoming the treasure of the kids of the Anawase School in Ghana. It's an amazing story. How long has it taken us to do this? Well, from the time the project really launched, 
to it being the playgrounds being installed in Ghana, 30 people from RMWB or within living within the region will fly to Ghana in August. Total time, eight months. Eight months. That doesn't make any sense. How do you pull off a worldwide project in eight months? How do you say that doesn't make sense? You know why? Because people are motivated. And you know why I know people are motivated? Because they're desperately looking for something of meaning that's authentic. And that's why they've been able, a small group of people have been able to pull this together so quickly. Would you agree with me that people are desperately looking for meaning today? Desperate. Would you agree with me they don't want to be involved in anything that's not authentic? Because we've been lied to, cheated. Even the most iconic brands, non-profit charity brands, have cheated us. It's like in Oshawa. The guy who's running the, guy who's running the hospital foundation embezzles $5 million or $2 million or whatever. And everybody goes like this. Well, I'm never giving to the hospital foundation again. So now all hospital foundations in Ontario, no one's giving to anymore. Because one guy was an idiot. Well, alleged idiot, let me be clear. It has not been proven that he was an idiot. He's alleged to be an idiot. But can I tell you something? I know him, he's an idiot. But anyway, <laughs> he's an idiot. My point is this. My point is, all of a sudden, I can either recruit or I can engage or I can try to get buy-in under an obligatory approach, which is no longer relevant, or I can say, wait a minute, people are desperately looking for meaning. Wait a minute. People are just looking for something that's authentic and sincere. If I can provide them something that's authentic and sincere and meaningful, and if I take into account, and you guys remember this, that we're in a user-driven society, a user-driven society, I'm probably going to get people to buy in. I'm probably going to get thousands of people to buy in. This is a, something that I know you're familiar with, so we'll use you as an example. There was a project in Bjorn, Bay, Newfoundland, Bjorn Bay Arm, sorry, right outside of where you're from, and you're very familiar with this project. So we gave a Let Them Be Kids award to her community, or a community just outside of her community, but she's very familiar with it. 500 people? 500 people showed up. They raised $190,000 in 100 days. There's $190,000 in 100 days. In this little town of how many people? Well, there's only, well, in that area. Well, you're looking at, it's a bigger scope. Yeah, but even in you're your... You're looking at under 7,000 people. Okay, hold on. Your bigger scope is 7,000 people. Yeah. I mean, that's a thriving metropolis in lovely Newfoundland, right? 7,000 people in a catchment area of that peninsula, right? They raised $190,000 in 100 days. They had 500 plus volunteers show up and build the, one of the largest community build playgrounds in all of Canada. Why? Because they're special there? Well, they are special. I went there, very special place. But also because it was meaningful. It was authentic. People were allowed to pick what they wanted to do. People were allowed to have a say in what was going to happen. People were allowed to participate to whatever degree or level. All were welcome to come and be a part. And that's why it was highly successful. Well, yeah, well that's fine. That's in Newfoundland. They have, they have that special community quality. Really? Well, we could have, we'll tell the same story in Vancouver. Kyle, when next time you're in, in Vancouver, I want you to go to the, com the corner of Commercial and 11th. It'll be right underneath a high-speed rail track, and you'll see a park. That park was named after Sergeant Larry Young, who was killed in an emergency response action, where he was getting a hostage out, a little kid, out of a, a hostage situation and got shot in the back of the head and died from his gunshot wound. And we named the park after Sergeant Larry Young. For context, that corner of Commercial and 11th is four blocks from where they firebombed the police station because they hate cops so much in that neighborhood. And yet, they named the park after a cop. The community did. 500 people showed up that day. So I know this works. And not because it's us doing it, but it's just simple principles. If your thing is authentic and sincere and meaningful, people will look at it. If they poke at it and still find it to be authentic, sincere, and meaningful, they'll buy into it. You have to do what you say and say what you 
That's right. So what's authenticity? We've talked about it before. I'm consistently what I say I am. As long as I'm consistently what I say I am, not perfect, don't have to be perfect, just consistently. So where's historical preference or reference for this or where does it come from? It's pretty simple, Pericles of Athens. So I gotta go on a historical journey with you. So this guy, there was this, this, this town called Athens. How many have ever heard of it? And in ancient Athens, not the Athens we know today, but in ancient Athens, it was the birthplace of democracy. It was the birthplace of arts and culture that we know today. It was the birthplace of geometry. It was the birthplace of so much of what we know society to be today was in this Athens. And there specifically was a 30-year time frame. Now, I came to find it because I was like you. I was in town, in the town that I was in. Here I was. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get anybody to be involved. Why couldn't I get anybody to buy in? What, why, how come nobody took pride anymore? Why couldn't I get people to be involved? They used to be involved, and they're not anymore. That was me. Frustrated, you know, upset, not happy. Not a happy brown boy. I know I'm black on the thing, but brown. Not a happy brown boy. So I said, well, wait a minute. There's got to be communities in history that were really thriving. Let me start looking. And I came to this guy, Pericles. Well, Pericles was the leader of the community for 30 years. Now, it's important to recognize in Athens was a true democracy. That means every citizen got to vote. So you would literally have every decision voted by every citizen. Six and seven thousand people would come together every day, every day, and have a debate and then decide things. A true democracy. We live in a representative parliamentary democracy where we elect people to represent us and go have those arguments. This guy, Pericles, had no authority over them. He was just one of ten people. He wasn't a general necessarily. He wasn't rich. He wasn't from an exclusive family. He was just one of ten guys that were the leaders. But no more or less authority than any of the other ten. Somehow, he took Athens and made it the greatest city, people say, in the history of mankind. But he had no real authority to compel people to do things. It wasn't threat of death. Kyle, if you don't do it, I'll kill you. That was Sparta, right? If you've ever heard of Sparta, the 300, the movie, the 300, that was Sparta. Don't do it, we'll kill you. But in Athens, it wasn't like that. So that intrigued me. That really made me stop and say, huh? I don't get it. And then I came across this quote. He said, if Athens would appear great to you, then consider her glories were purchased by valiant men who understood their responsibility and acted on their duty. And I remember when I first read that, I, I felt like he was saying to me, hey, kid, if you think we had a great city, then know this. It was because I got everyone to understand what they were responsible to do and then go do it. I then took that and I said to myself, huh, have I ever seen that? And I thought, wow, I'm running this big hotel casino, because at the time I was. I'm running this big hotel casino, and there's certain maids that their rooms are clean no matter who their supervisor is. No matter who's watching over them, their rooms are perfect. There's certain valet attendants that no matter who their supervisor is, they're great. There's certain operators who answer the phone that no matter who their manager is, they're awesome at their job. Have any of you met people that no matter who their boss is, they're great at their job? Somehow, those people understood their responsibility and then acted on their duty. And that's when it dawned on me. Whether it's in a community with citizens or whether it's in a workplace, if I can somehow get someone to understand their responsibility and act on their duty, then I'm gonna be successful. The key is, how do I get them to do it today? Because in the past, I didn't have to explain it. I would just look at you and say, the wolves are coming, we all need to rally together. And you would look at me and go, okay, I'm in. Wolves are coming, I'm in. Today, I'd be like, wolves are coming, you'd be like, tough crap for you, dude. I can run faster than you, Ian, you're stuck. 
That would be today's mentality. So over the next three weeks, what we're going to try to do is learn from Pericles and learn some basic concepts of how do I get people to buy in today? How do I get people to put in their time, their talent, their treasure? Whether it's in the community or in the workplace. And how do I get people to take pride? Talk to me about pride. What's pride? What's pride? Okay, honor within yourself. Well, how do I see pride? Where does, when, you, it might be hard to put your hand on it, but give me some examples of pride. Is people's front yard clean if they take pride in their community? Are they more, will, are they more watchful over their kids if they take pride in their family? Do they show up on work on time? They stay late, come in on their day off. Do they need to be supervised less if they take pride? Yeah, all of those things are a result of pride. So as a leader, do I have a way to develop pride? I say this to mayors all the time and CAOs. Are you strategically building community pride? Do you have a way to build community pride? So that somebody sticks out their chest and says, I'm from that town. If you do, then I bet you the town's a little cleaner. If you do, I bet you the crime rate's a little lower. If you do, I bet you that the community thrives a little bit better if there's community pride. Not community arrogance. That's different. Not arrogance. Pride. I'm proud of my town. And it manifests itself in what I do in the community. So over the next kind of, uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about these principles. I just want to read this really, really quickly. For two millennia after Athens lived, we still marvel at what it achieved. But the visible remains, impressive as they are, those are those buildings, you ever seen those Greek pillars? And you walk into any Greek restaurant in the world, you see those Greek pillars? Those are the buildings on the top of the Acropolis that were built by citizens. Those weren't built by master builders. They still are existence 2,000 years later because they were built by citizens. And Pericles engaged them to build those temples. Pericles confronted the problem that faces any free democratic society, how can citizens be persuaded to make sacrifices necessary for its success? We face that same dilemma. Tyrants and dictators can rely on mercenaries and compulsion to defend their states. Rare states like Sparta, a closed authoritarian society, could inoculate in their people a willingness to renounce their private lives for almost entirely. Today's example of that might be, and I'm not, this isn't meant to be offensive, the closest thing to that might be a Russia or a China or a totalitarian state like that. It's Sparta-like. But democracies cannot use such devices. Instead, democratic leaders involves a freer kind of, kind of public ex education. Pericles sought to teach the Athenians that their own interests were tied together with those of their community and that they could not secure or prosper unless their state was secure and prosperous, that the ordinary man could achieve greatness only through the greatness of their society. Now, what's funny is the same is true for you at the housing, Connie. The same is true for you. If you can get your employees to believe that the success of the organization and their personal success are in alignment, they're going to they're gonna do better for you. In the community is the same. If I can get the youth of the community to think that their dreams or goals are time to, tied to the betterment of the community, then they're going to give back to the community. So although this might be a historical reference and seem so, so far away, it is absolutely the struggle we have today. And we don't know how to do it very well. So over the next three weeks, we're going to try to teach you how to do this. How do I be that Pericles community builder where I can take a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds and marshal them towards a common goal? All right, let's take the quick survey. Really quick. So the, 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 the competency is catalyst for responsibility places a priority on engaging and cultivating ownership and responsibility in others. One, I'm totally not like that. Ten, I'm totally like that. You go through the survey on your own. I'll just read them randomly for the people that are watching the archive. I believe I have a responsibility to my family, employees, and organization, organization and communities. Community. I believe that others are capable 
and have the right to make decisions that affect their situation. It's one thing to talk about empowerment. It's another thing to actually walk it out. I can apply a catalyst approach for my work with, and with stakeholders. What does catalyst approach mean? It means you come to the conclusion you don't have to do everything. That's what Connie came to the conclusion of these last three weeks, that she could delegate out and everything would be okay. I understand the importance of articulating values and have systems in place for doing so. I personally define issues as opportunities to motivate action. I understand that pride is a powerful form of human capital. I have a strategy in place to build pride. I have a system in place for community, communicating what winning is, for the groups I lead, and for celebrating my people's achievement. I understand what it takes to get buy-in and a process in place for doing so. I have effective tools to mobilize human resources to get things done through others. Once you've kind of filled out that survey, pick up your eyes, and that way I'll know you're done. Now remember, you're rating yourself so that you can kind of focus your learning, act, your learning energies for the last next couple weeks. Once you're done, just kind of pick up your eyes, and that way I'll know you're done. I will say this. Sometimes people think that the first one is trite. I believe I have a responsibility to my family, my employees, my organization, and community. A responsibility to do what? To be the best of yourself. To be the best that I possibly can be. Yeah. Remember a couple of weeks ago, and I think you even put it on your Facebook page, there was that poem I sent out, I am only one, but I am one. Can't do everything, but I can do something. That which I can do, I ought to do, and that which I ought to do, I will do. Somebody gave me a very nice... Uh, photo of that framed, or not photo, a painting of that framed, and appreciate that. And um, still at the hotel on the desk. <laughs> I think we have that. Oh, good. Yes. So the, the, um, this whole idea that you are somebody and you have something to offer, and can you offer it, and will you offer it? So responsibility to do your best. So 50 years ago, 100 years ago in this community, people gave their best, and that's why there's a community still alive today. And now you're building community, and then you'll take it and do some, and somebody 50 years from now will do something with it. And it'll be based on the time and energy that you put in, and the effort and energy you put in. So I would encourage you not to look past that first one, even though it's easy to kind of just move on past it. I have a responsibility. Cynthia walks up to me and says, help the children of Ghana. This lady you don't even know, Cynthia, walks up and help the children of Ghana. I'm like, okay, well, what the heck do I have to do with the children of Ghana? And I had no intention of helping the children of Ghana, but then the opportunity presented itself. And then Councilman Kirshner steps in, and, and Joanne, and Glenn, and, and then Rosses of the world step in, and people, Lana, and people I don't even know, and then people in Ontario step in, and people in... Africa step in, and the next thing you know, everybody just does their little responsibility, and the next thing you know, a project happens. So don't walk past that first one, I would encourage you. So where does responsibility begin? So turn the page. How many of you know leaders that are irresponsible? Can all of you, raise your hand if you know a leader in your life, in your autobiography that was irresponsible. Raise your hand. Okay, we all know it. It's almost trite, right? It's almost a joke. We have so many leaders that are irresponsible. So I think it's important that we all, the first step in being a catalyst to get other people to be responsible is, I've got to have a process to make sure that I'm responsible. We are all individually responsible and collectively accountable. Especially if we're in government. We're individually responsible, we're collectively accountable. And I think you've got to have a code of conduct. What's a code of conduct? What does that even mean? What's a code of conduct? We've heard that before, but what is it? What's a code of conduct? Okay, so it's a way of being. By definition, a personal system of principles, values, standards of behavior that guide what you think, say, and do. Do you have a code of conduct? Now, you can have an internal code of conduct. 
But who's the true arbiter of your code of conduct? Those around you. Those you lead, those in the community. Do organizations have codes of conduct? And oftentimes, is there a gap between the code of conduct that we have on the wall and what we actually do? How many years now since amalgamation occurred? 95. 90, well, uh, this is a better question. I'll ask you. It's better, no, no. better to ask you than Joanne. <laughs> no, no, look, this is relevant. RMWB, when that amalgamation occurred, the people, the proponents of the amalgamation made promises along the way. Right of why it was a benefit to rural communities, why it was important, so on and so forth. Right now, you, I know you weren't here. Yeah, but there there was promises, right? And Dross, jump in here also because rural areas are your responsibility as well. There was certain reasons why it was a good idea, and I'm sure I wasn't here, but I'm sure that was sold to people in some way, shape, or form. So that the organization, the proponents of the amalgamation, said. Here's our code of conduct. Here's what you can believe from us. Here's what you can trust from us. Here's what you can expect from us once this amalgamation occurs. And then the amalgamation occurred. Today, and this is for the people that are in the rural area, do you think that what people said would happen and what has actually happened from your perspective are congruent or out of alignment? What do you think? Now, you guys mumbled it, but what did you really say? Okay. Now, the cool thing is, and I'll say this personally, I think you have people in the room that desperately want to bring that into alignment. I believe that in my heart. I believe that the, 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 the people that are here that now represent that organization really sincerely, and I think this is a manifestation of that, that we're flying our asses up here for like eight people. Are you kidding me? Now, I love you eight people. <laughs> but I think that that is a true manifestation of people's heart because I think it's in alignment with their code of conduct. So what it was, Maggie said it, I don't know what it was before I got here, Ian, but I can tell you what it's gonna be while I'm here because I have a code of conduct. You and I have only gotten to know each other really an hour at a time on a plane or in a car, but I know you have a certain code of conduct. It's clear to me, man. And where that got built in Timmins or wherever it got built in you as a bush girl up in Northern Ontario, I don't know where it got built in you, but it's in you. And I think probably the people that work with you would agree. And as you get to know her, you're going to agree too. It's in her. So she can't speak to what happened before, but while she's on, it's her watch, she's going to have a certain code of conduct. Well, people respect that today. And when they poke at it, as long as it oozes the same stuff, that's probably not the best metaphor, but <laughs> as long as it... Yeah, exactly. As long as it is the same consistently, you'll believe it. So for me to be able to get people to give me their time, talent, and treasure, I better have a code of conduct. And I better, I would strongly encourage that it needs to be up front. Now, just because I have a code of conduct doesn't mean people will give me their time, talent, and treasure. But I guarantee you this, if you don't have one, people aren't giving you time, talent, and treasure today. People are just looking at you and going, I ain't doing it. So... It won't make people do it, but it'll actually stop people from doing it if you don't have one. So most people are of the opinion that it takes a lot of energy and a lot of work to create a code of conduct. I think it's only three questions. So I'm going to ask these three questions, and I want you to start writing some things down. Now, let me be clear on something. There's a difference between intention and practical. So... We judge ourselves on our intentions. We judge others on their actions. Here's a very practical example of that. Ian, I get the phone call last night. Oh, well, I guess it wasn't last night. This was a couple of trips ago. Ian, and I may have shared this story with Ross. Ian, yes, Gina. Did you change the light bulb in the garage? Ian, to Gina. Uh, which any man in this room means, no, I did not. <laughs> but let me quickly think of an excuse of why I didn't. I said, no, honey, I didn't. You know, I was trying to get out the door to catch the plane. I didn't get a chance. I didn't put the new light bulb in. Yes, the light bulb is out. I'm really, really sorry. 
She said, well, that sorriness is really, really great, but I have a huge cut on my shin because I went out to the garage and I probably need a tetanus shot now because I cut myself on that damn rusty thing that you call a bike that's been out there for so many freaking, how many of you can just, right, I'm getting this. Exactly. <laughs> Voicemail, right? So here I am just getting ripped. And any of you women in the room, you know, Everything I've ever done irresponsibly and said I would do is now being coming out. 13 years ago, you said you would do this and we still haven't gotten that. And you said you'd take me to Bora Bora. We've never been to damn Bora Bora. And, I mean, just every freaking promise I've ever made, I'm just getting blasted. Why? Because I really did have every intention of putting the light bulb in. And I really did just get too busy. I really was trying to pack and run and do this and make sure and da da da. Oh, I'm playing and ah, out the door. But all she cares about is she cut her leg and there's no light bulb. And because she's only five foot two, even if she got on the tallest ladder, she would not be able to reach it on the top rung. So she's in a place of desperate. I got to get this light bulb. I got little kids in and you're flying off all over the world and I need that light bulb fixed and you're not coming back for three days. And she's bent out of shape. My perspective, get off my back. I had all of the right intentions. Okay, fast forward a little bit. Same night, call the front desk. Hey, uh, my heater's not working. And it was cold that day in Fort McMurray, that night. My heater's not working. We will send someone. Well, you said you'd send someone an hour and a half ago. And I need to get to bed. And I just got a new one ripped by my wife and I really wanna go to bed. So get somebody over here. Well, I'm sorry. I got really, really busy. I got caught up in a lot of things. We've got a number of different problems here in the hotel and I didn't have a chance to call. So what's she saying? I had all the right intentions and I'm hammering her because I got a cold room. <laughs> so before we start this discussion of code of conduct, we have to clarify that oftentimes we judge you on your performance, but I judge me on what I intended. That gap will cause you problems. So no more walking off of what we intended. We can only walk off of other people's realities, especially if we're a public entity, especially if we're an organization, especially if we're trying to recruit volunteers, especially if we're trying to raise money in the community. We have to hold, we have to judge ourselves higher. We can't just go off of, well, we intended to do that. Oh, I meant to do that. People don't care. My wife didn't care, big cut. And trust me, I still get this. Yeah. See that shin right there? Yeah, I need to take her to Bora Bora. Okay, so what I want to do now is I'm going to ask some questions and you're going to write down some answers because we're going to build your code of conduct right now. Now, some of you may have already done this exercise in your life, but it's always good to revisit this. Okay, so what are three values you hold dear? And how would people see it every day? So what are three values? Honesty, integrity, hard work, commitment to purpose. What are three values you hold dear? What are they? What are those three values? And more importantly, how would I see it? So it's not just to say, I value love. Well, how do people see love on a daily basis? A lot of talk about authenticity today. This is the gap. This is how I determine whether someone's authentic or not. Not that you tell me what your values are, but you can tell me how I would see it on a regular basis. All right, anybody willing to share one of the values you have? Okay, value, commitment. How would I see that? Give me some examples of how any of us in the room would see that Doreen values commitment because we see her do blank. I think one of the points is, you know, Doreen always comes. Even when she was sick, she said, Gary, extra handouts so that if people forgot them, then they were here. She Doreen has kind of been, just for all of you, and you're absolutely right about that. So Doreen has kind of been my go-to person of making sure we have extra handouts so I don't have to bring him up from Fort McMurray. On the week that she was sick and unable to come, here comes Gary. Gary comes walking in and we're like, hey, you coming to the session tonight? He's like, I ain't coming to the session. But Doreen said you needed these. 
Would all of you agree with me that's commitment? Yes or no? A lot of talk about authenticity, that's authenticity. I say what I am and I deliver the goods even though all of us would have been like this, oh, Doreen's sick tonight or Doreen wasn't able to make it. Uh, okay, we understand why there's no handouts. Seem like a little thing it does, but it's a big, big thing because it reinforces her value and we see it in action. All right, somebody else. Give me, go. Kindness. kindness. So you value kindness. Kindness is important to you. Give me some ways that we would see kindness in your daily activity. Okay. So somehow you're just very demeanor takes that across. Kindness. I know that every time I've interacted with you, you are incredibly respectful, incredibly kind. Very kind, very respectful. Okay, somebody else. What do you hold dear? A value, a value. If you were checking on that HAB score, I'm gonna kick your ass, just so you know. We talked about this at the beginning. Okay, somebody else. Somebody tell me. Integrity. All right, integrity. So how do we see integrity in your life? How would we see it? <laughs> ah, but then I know you admitted it. That's right. That's, so right. that's, that's integrity. <laughs> 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 um, I feel, for me, integrity is being who you are every, at every aspect of your life, like maintaining um, your authenticity, your truth to yourself um, at work, at home, in your life, at the grocery store. You, you just. But tell me how you do that. Tell me, give me an example of that. Ross, pull that door shut, would you please? Okay, so give me an example how we would give me an example of when you've done that or where we would see that for you personally. Okay. Good man. Good man. That's good. That's strong. Tons of people of all organizations who put that air miles card. Yep. So, the point that he's making right now is a fine line, and you know people might push back on him and say, "Ah, come on, who's really getting hurt?" And da da da, da isn't it? It's personal value system. Remember, we talked about communication styles. We said fact-based communicators, value-based communicators. So you have some people that he would say to them, don't do that, and they would go, well, what are you talking about? Why are you being such a hard ass on me, excuse my language, because their worldview, their communication approach, their value system wouldn't find any problem with that at all. This is a very personal thing, right? Now, you, and I think from the reaction of everybody in the room, and myself know that that's outside of our values. But there would be some people that would be like, what's the big deal? Nine out of ten people will put the better mouth uh, Probably. Why not think twice about it because it's a little value. In fact, the government of Canada changed the rules to allow for that, but they put the stipulation in that uh, if you use, if you collect air miles or car benefits, you have to be willing to use that for government travel. Now, no one to my knowledge ever has ever been held accountable to that. However, I know a person, a person that I work with as a military policeman lost his badge over that very thing. He would get government travel, he'd go get rooms, and then he learned about four star free room, and didn't think twice about it, took his wife, and went and used that free room. He lost his credentials or his badge over it in the military police. 
Well, it's stealing. I mean, it's stealing. Most people wouldn't think twice about that in today's world, and we actually changed the rules kind of to soften that. I don't think it should have, but nine out of ten people in every organization, or eight out of ten people, will flip out the air miles card. And that's just a very tiny example. We can, I think, purposely go to the shelf and fill up the government vehicle or the company vehicle, or uh, the fact that it's, uh, someone takes a company vehicle home every night doesn't actually move the revenue. Sure. So why is it important? So we've talked now about some values. Integrity, commitment, kindness. You expanded on integrity. Why, would, why do you think I'm recommending or suggesting that you proactively establish what your values are and proactively establish how people are going to see it regularly? Why do you think I'm asking you or recommending to you that you proactively establish those things? Do what you say and say what you do. Let's be seen. Let others know that that's, that's what we get. Let's so. Said, well, can you, if you make the decision before, when the time comes, when you have to make the decision, you already made that decision. That's just Okay. Yeah. So then it's not hard work. Go back to the contextual situation we're in. Back here, participation was obligatory. Here, people don't trust, prove it to me. I'm more likely to give my time, talent, and treasure to somebody that I respect and trust. So, I know and you know that if I proactively say I am blank and then proactively determine how people are going to see that, I'm more likely to do it. And you can be seen as a jerk for not doing what has been the tradition, right? So it goes the opposite direction. What's traditionally happened in Northern Post, not just us, but all the yeah. organizations, some of us, us as leaders, and now I have to say no to that and try to explain why, but the people that have been here before me, they're not accepting it well. They're, they're not accepting it. The guys that will come after, that'll be the way of life, and, mm -hmm. and if they've never been to Northern Post, they won't be different. Mm -hmm. And so, so when I, the point I hear you making is this. That's why it's so important that we're consistent in our values and consistent in our standards and consistent in our code of conduct. Because to clean up the mess of somebody that's not adhering to those standards takes a lot of grief. Takes a lot of grief. So if you want to get it, you know, if you want to be the, you know, the good guy or the good gal, and you don't hold standards, and you don't have a code of conduct, and you bend some of those codes of conduct of your organization, just know you're creating a huge mess for everybody that comes after you. Because when somebody comes along and does what you're doing, hey, this is the standard. You then deal with a lot of grief, right? And I can only hope whatever I put in place now will be maintained by the guys taking my chair after you. Right. But they can revert very quickly back to the way it was. That's right. Okay, second question. So the first question is that I want you to think about in the coming days is what are three values I have, three things that are important to me, and then the most important part of it is and how will people see it? Second, what are three things coworkers or people in the community can absolutely guarantee from me? So write those down. What can they absolutely guarantee from you? Now as you're starting to write down, let me just throw a couple things out as you're writing. Can they absolutely guarantee for you to be five minutes late? Can they absolutely guarantee for you to make a flippant remark in an inappropriate time? Can they absolutely guarantee for you to forget paperwork? Can they ab so 
I mean, if I was sitting down and talking to them, what would they tell me they can absolutely guarantee from you? Remember, intention, action. So for some of us, we write down, well, they can absolutely guarantee this, this, and this. And we think it's very positive. But they would tell you a whole different story because they could absolutely guarantee you're five minutes late, absolutely guarantee you're going to forget something, absolutely guarantee, absolutely guarantee, absolutely guarantee, because your pattern of life shows that. How many of you ever had a boss that you could absolutely guarantee some of the things I just mentioned? You are less likely to give them your time, talent, and treasure. Now, we're forgiving. Oh, they're busy. Oh, they're this. Oh, they're that. But you're probably not going to get their all from them, their buy-in, their allegiance, because they're probably a little bit hedged. So, somebody willing to share, what is... What are one of the three things that we can absolutely guarantee from you? Okay. Doreen says you can absolutely guarantee I'm going to tell you what I think. And it's going to be the truth as I see it. Okay. Somebody else. Absolutely guarantee. Okay. Absolutely guarantee that this guy is going to work. Okay. Absolutely guarantee a work ethic. Somebody else. What can we absolutely guarantee from you? I told over and beyond about everything else to help. Like, even though my job's not that, I'll still help. Okay, so you're going to live out the spirit of your work, not just the letter of your job. Yeah. Okay? Anybody else? I, I take a great amount of pride in my work, and I make sure everything's done to the best of my ability. Okay, so you're going to take pride in your task. All right? Okay. Well, and that's, and that's what I just said, right? So sometimes the employee, if I talk to the employee, they'll tell me that they can absolutely guarantee, she's rolling her eyes, that, um, and here's the tough question for you, sir. The tough question for you is now that you've said that in front of 15 of your closest friends over the next nine weeks or eight weeks, are you going to really work hard at that? It's unlikely that I will relax in some things. It, it, I know me. It's unlikely that I will stop being so picky on certain things. I recognize it, and I know I need to relax in some things, but well, I probably won't. I mean, uh, it, I've been more concerned with, uh, to be quite honest, last week's day was more beneficial for me. If I could do a little bit more I'm with you, but what, what I'm okay, either way, in either thing, you are very self-aware. You're a very intelligent, you're a very intelligent guy, and you're very, very self-aware. And somebody that would say, I need to work on my time management, or I, I need to be less picky in certain areas, because in your line of work, there's certain areas I don't want you to be less picky in as a citizen. I want you to continue to be as picky as you are about certain things, man. Now, other things, yeah, maybe you need to take a chill, like my kids would say, you need to chill ax. Right? My little Nadia, you need to chillax on certain things. But frankly, my friend, I don't want you to chillax in certain areas. I want you to be as stringent and as tough and as quote unquote picky. And that's now, the difference between our generation and the new generation. Sure. But the question I have for you, and this is, you don't have to answer it, you are very self aware. Are you going to take some of this stuff, establish it, and start working hard at it? And then, and making some of those fundamental changes that you know and people that work with you know you need to make? In some areas, I, I said you don't have to answer. I don't, you don't have to answer. But it's something you got to think about. Okay. So, code of conduct. Three things I, you can, I absolutely value. How will I see it? Three things that you can absolutely guarantee from me. And then finally, what are three things you don't tolerate? What are three, write them down. Three things that you absolutely do not tolerate. Somewhat, perhaps. Three things that you don't tolerate. Three things you don't tolerate. Three things you don't tolerate. 
three things you don't tolerate. All right, somebody share one of your three things that you just, just don't tolerate. Okay, abuse of authority. Somebody else. Coming late. What's that? Coming late. Coming late. I'm always late, man. I gotta work on it. <laughs> Dishonesty. Okay, a lack of integrity. Lack of passion. Lack of passion. So if people aren't enthused or motivated, eh, eh, you don't like that. Okay, not negativity. So the first thing we have to do when responding to A, B, and C of what three things you do not tolerate, what's the first thing you have to do with those three things? Exactly. The first thing you got to do is shine them back on you. Am I ever negative? Do I ever lack passion? Am I ever, you know, a little late? Am I ever shortchanging people sometimes? You know, I got to look back at myself, things I don't tolerate. And then what do I do when I encounter that? Does it flip me out? Do I get upset? You know, what do I do with it? Because it's one thing to say I don't tolerate it. It's another thing to do something positive with that energy. Those nine responses are your code of conduct. That's it. Three things I value. Three things that people can absolutely guarantee for me. Three things I don't tolerate. That's your code of conduct. I don't think it needs to be a long mission statement. I don't think it needs to be a long value statement. Fact is, some of the best documents ever written in the history of mankind are less than a page. Some of the most profound words ever written, less than a page. So if you do not have a code of conduct today, or if you haven't visited it in a long, long time, I encourage you to go back home and thoughtfully consider this exercise. And then make it a point to put those responses, put those responses in the forefront of your mind for the next thir three weeks. So that people will begin to have a deeper respect for you because what, they, what you say you are and what you do are congruent. So write that down. Say, do, and write the word gap. One of the reasons that people are apathetic today is because they find their leaders to have a say, do, gap. One of the reasons that people at least have told me in the rural communities that they're a little bit apathetic when it comes in terms of RMWB is because in the past there's been a say-do gap. Al Amalgamation is going to bring you these things, it's going to do all this stuff, and, da -da 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 -da, and then it doesn't happen. And you're shaking your head. Have you experienced that as a new person coming on board? Yeah. That people have said there's a say-do gap. Now whether there has been one or not doesn't matter, does it? Their perception is there's been a say-do gap. The only way... The only way we're going to turn this thing around, people's perception, is to close the say-do gap. I have actually said this in some communities when doing community development projects. I know that all of you in this room at this big town hall meeting, I know that none of you trust us up here on the stage. And I know you don't trust us because you are, you've experienced this, you've experienced this, you've experienced this, you've experienced this, and all of those things would make me not trust the people on the stage too. And everybody kind of looks at me like, uh, really? And then I say, so here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to give us five minutes. And if, if we are trustworthy for the five minutes, give us 15 minutes. And if we're trustworthy for that 15 minutes, give us a half hour. If that's what it's going to take, if it's going to take five minutes of time of building trust with you, I'm down for that. So even in the most toxic environments, you can still get buy-in. If you're willing to be upfront and honest and just say, wow, gosh, if I looked at all of, all of this, I might not trust us either. So let me start all over. Can you give me five minutes? And then 15, and then a half hour, and then an hour, and then a day, and then a week, and then a month. And eventually, you'll build up enough deposits in the emotional bank account that when you do screw up, it won't take you all the way back to zero. Oh, yeah. You definitely will screw up. Okay. So code of conduct. That's the first step in being a catalyst for responsibility. Now let's talk about buy-in. 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 Somebody tell me how today you get people around you to buy-in. Whether that's employees, whether that's volunteers, whether that's community members. What do you do to get another human being to buy-in? Right? So Connie's starting a new thing in the housing a uh, di division in the housing thing and she's got two employees, three employees and she wants them to buy into the new approach. What do you do now? How do you get them to buy in? You ask them for their opinion before you decide. Okay, so that's a good step. What else? 
How do you get buy-in? When you go into a neighborhood and you want to get the people in the neighborhood to buy in to the new thing, or if you want to get another organization to buy into your community project, what do you do? So she goes and asks their opinion beforehand. Okay, what else could you do? Okay, ask for ideas. Okay, go ahead. Okay, what else? So both of you are saying similar. You're going to listen. You're going to gain, ask for ideas. What else? Good. So, okay, so I'm more likely to get buy-in if they perceive that it's in alignment with their dreams and goals. And then you said? If I can show them the benefit, okay. If they feel like it's their idea, that's good. So there was a guy, a doctor, a PhD, not a medical doctor, named Dr. Ludwig. So Dr. Ludwig was down at the University of Texas. And he did a whole exploration on how do I get people to buy into my thing in the context of a society where it's no longer obligatory. In a society where people are free to choose, like in Pericles' day. And that I don't have any authority on them, but I still got to get them to buy in. I can't get done what I want to get done unless these people who I have no authority in buy in. He boiled it down to three things, and they're on the next page of your handout. He said that there was only three things. And he encouraged us all, and, and all of you think this through. He encouraged us by saying, and don't do anything new unless you ask these three questions. So number one, people will buy in if they perceive it to be relevant. Relevant. If people perceive it to be relevant, they'll buy in. What does that mean? Or give me an example. Nobody will show up to the public meetings. We have an apathetic society. By the way, we're closing your school and we'll be busing your kids in the dark 45 minutes. How many of you agree with me that meeting will be packed? But they are apathetic. They don't care. But as soon as it's about their kids and driving 45 minutes in the dark and closing their local rural school, how many of you know everybody's showing up? Because it's relevant. How do I get John Q. Public to turn off Hockey Night in Canada? How do I get them to turn off Canadian Idol? How do I get them to stop looking at their phone? No, I'm just kidding. Um, if it's relevant to them personally. So before you ever do the project, you've got to say to yourself, how am I going to prove to them it's relevant to them? What words am I going to use? What messaging am I going to use? What statistics am I going to use? What emotional conversation am I going to use? How am I going to make sure that these employees realize this new software program is relevant to them? Instead of them looking and going, Ugh, that's going to be such a pain in the ass. I don't want to do that. New software. Are you kidding me? We just got used to the old one. So whether it's buy-in within the workplace or within the community, the first question is, how will we show them the relevance of this change? Number two, impact. How are we explaining the impact of the action or the impact of inaction? And what words are we using? Well, we want to do this because it's going to be better for you. Okay, that's just a lie that's coming out of the corporate office. Because I, or, you know, the red square. I know it's not going to be better for me. Nothing they ever do is better for me. How many of you ever heard that? And all the people that work in RMWB up here are like, yeah, we hear that all the time. So how do we as the leaders... Make sure that they see the impact. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a positive impact. It could be the result of inaction. Here's, right, could be, here's the negative consequences if we don't do this. Finally, quality. People will, will not buy in unless they see it that it's of quality. So in other words, if the organization or if you or the group have done a bunch of stuff that lack quality, people are not going to buy in. Because no one wants to align themselves with a loser. People only want to align themselves with a winner. So if, if uh, here's a better example. Down the hallway here, just like at Keanu College, or <coughs> at the store, or at Canada Post, there's always that cork board. How many cork board? And on that cork board are flyers 
of community events and community activities, fundraisers, whatever. Certain logos that you see, you say to yourself, that event is going to suck. Because you just look at the logo and you go, they do crappy stuff. I know it's going to be crappy. I like them, but it's just not going to be very good. I'm not going. Yeah, but even if there's going to be food. That's right. But follow me here. There's other flyers when you see them. You see the logos down at the bottom. You don't even have to know what the event is. Just that one logo tells you it's going to be great. Let's say in a community like Fort Chip where there has to be food involved. There's certain ladies in town or catering groups in town that if you know they're cooking the food, you are showing up. Am I right or wrong? There's others that if you hear so-and-so's catering the food, you're not going. Quality. You will not align yourself with something that's not of quality. So one of the tough questions, courageous conversations that we have to have with ourselves before rolling out anything new is this. How's our quality quotient. Have we rolled some things out that have been bumpy before? Have we tried some things that failed before? Are people not going to buy in because they don't want to align perception of aligning with something that's a losing battle? Or is our reputation strong and people are going to coalesce around just about anything we do? This is a personal example, but it's a true example. Call Ottawa. Hey, Vern, Senator Vern White. We're going to do a project in Ghana. What do you need me to do? I need to see the high commissioner in Ken, uh, uh, of, of Ghana. Do you have a connection to the high commissioner? No problems, Ian. Be happy to do it. And he'll set up a meeting with the high commissioner. No problems. Now stop and think about that. He is letting some guy use his credibility to sit down in front of the high commissioner of Ghana, uh, an international ambassador. Why is he willing to do that? Because we've done projects of quality. So he knows he's good to go. He knows his butt is covered. He's not going to get in trouble. I'm not going to go in and do anything dumb. He's okay with sticking his neck out a little bit to set up the meeting. Okay, what do we learn from that? We learn from that that this quality thing gets people to buy in. You. You can make five phone five calls tomorrow and rally troops, and you could probably pull off just about anything that needed to be done because you've built a reputation. Ross has built that kind of reputation in rural areas. He can rally the troops because he's got, they both have a track record of doing quality things. However, we organizationally, your organization, our organization, your organization, we do have to ask the questions. Does this stakeholder group believe we're of quality? Because even though, let's say Ross personally has done some great things, you may still be dealing with the residue of a perception that people have of the governmental entity. Is that right or wrong? And you've got to know that. Because otherwise you're not going to get people to buy in. And you might have to be honest about it. You might have to say, I know that there is some residue from previous things. I'm sorry about that. Blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, go ahead. No, it does not. The RMWB card doesn't always get, it might get the door shut on you. Okay, follow me here. This is really, really important. Somebody in your organization needs to be the buy-in police that asks these three questions before you do anything new. Can we explain the relevance to that stakeholder group? And how are we going to explain that relevance? How are we going to make the relevance case? And remember, let's go back to communication styles. How many ways do I need to be able to communicate that? Four ways. Do you remember what the four ways are? Anybody remember? What are the four communication styles? Who remembers? Close. Values. What else? Fact. Belief. So I better be able to explain the relevance through each one of the four communication styles before I walk into the group and try to get them to buy in. I better be able to explain the impact of what we're doing through the four communication styles. And I better be able to ask myself the hard question, are we of quality? And what if the answer comes back no? That the perception of the people that I'm trying to penetrate, the stakeholder group I'm trying to penetrate and get buy-in from, what if their perspective is no, you're not of quality, then what? But what am I saying to them? 
to move towards buy-in. They have a perception that we haven't been of quality in the past. You validate them. You say, I know that there is a perception that we have not been of quality. I can see why in this, this, and this instance we haven't been of quality and we've taken this, this, and this step to rectify that. No one is expecting that, is the, are they? They're not going to expect that. They're not going to expect that we're just going to air our dirty laundry and show everybody, hey, this is what we did wrong. Here's the steps that we've taken. Now, will that get them to buy in? Not necessarily, but I guarantee you, if you try to fool them, you try to trick them, and you don't talk about the elephant in the room, you'll never get them to buy in. What's that? It ups your stocks. It ups, ups your stocks for sure. Is this brain surgery? I don't have time to do that, Ian. Have any of you implemented a change that turns sour? How long does it take you to clean up a sour change? How long? Years? Months? How many of you are in positions of leadership today that you're cleaning up poor implementation of change even now? Years later, absolutely. It's in your best interest. It's in your best interest. I want to take, we got a few minutes left. So I want to unpack this just a little bit more in the, in the, in, on this page. So if I'm going to go try to get buy-in from a stakeholder group, whether that's another organization who I need them to partner with us to get it done, whether that's a governmental entity or whether it's just people in the neighborhood. So I, Step number one, I ask myself the buy-in question. Can I explain its relevance? Is it perceived to be of high quality and will it perceive to be a high impact? I have to understand the stakeholder, just like we talked about in our communication approaches, right? Their needs, their wants, their desires, their concerns. What's their motivation? I ask myself, what's my messaging going to be? Before I go into the conversation, I clarify my messaging. What is my desired outcome? How am I going to say it? When should I say it? Where should I say it? What could the potential reaction be? And I might even visualize the conversation. Then I say to myself, what's the best way for me to deliver that message? Is it face to face? Is it in writing? Is it via a text box or Facebook? Is it nonverbal? And then here's a couple of tips. Don't finish other people's sentences when you're sitting and trying to communicate with them. Don't answer your, their questions with a question. Well, let me ask you something. They ask you, well, let me ask you something. Don't do that. Effect. Did I get the buy-in that I sought? Did I re reach my intended outcome? So I've got this stakeholder group over here. I need them to buy in. I'm going to sit through and talk through with my group. Have we shown that it's relevant? Can we show the impact? Can we show that we've been of quality or have we done an evaluation of that? Then when I go and meet with them, just like we've talked about in building our sphere of influence, am I doing the talking? Remember we talked about building our sphere of influence. Who's doing the talking, me or them? And how much should they be talking and how much should I be talking? Anybody remember the percentages? 80-20, right? They're doing 80% of the talking, I'm 80% of the talking, I'm listening. I'm only talking 20% of the time. I'm listening for their dreams, their hopes, their wants, their desires. Because there's nothing more powerful than a person feeling understood. Then and only then do I share with them what we're doing. But before, remember, prior to the meeting, I made sure my ducks were in a row. I made sure that I could explain the relevance to them. I explained, I, can, I, I was assured, that, um, I ensured that I could explain the impact and I could take care of any quality objections that they may have. Now, all of that said, does it guarantee buy-in, yes or no? Well, of course it doesn't guarantee buy-in, but you're gonna be a hell of a lot more likely to get buy-in. It's no longer obligatory. You can't force people to get involved. We can't pass laws on volunteerism. We can't pass laws on charity. Frankly, any monkey can follow the written law. It takes a certain level of enlightenment to follow the unwritten law that makes a community worth living in, being kind, having commitment, all the values that we talked about earlier. So somehow we've got to educate people in following the unwritten law. 
not tonight, because we've come close to the end of our time, but in the coaching session and the week after the coaching session, we will talk about pride and how do I build organizational pride? How do I build community pride? You can just drive through some towns. Have you ever driven through a town? You can just look around and say, this town takes significant pride. How many of you have ever driven through some towns or neighborhoods and you just look around and go, they just don't have any pride? Can anybody relate to what I'm talking about? So wait, go ahead. No, I was just... Go ahead. We got across last year in New York because mm. you hear so much stuff about New York and we went expecting that you're going to see the, you know, rats running down the street. You know, all these folks. And New York, you never saw, everything was cleaned up, everything was, people were friendly, they could excuse me when they got into you like at the sidewalk and whatever. We, we kept on saying, this is not what we were expecting. Right? And now, imagine here in Fort McMurray, I think you guys are another community, and there's three or four of us all in Michigan that should know better. And then somebody said after 911, it humbled New Yorkers, and mm. they changed their attitude mm. it, and you could feel it, but you couldn't even see it mm -hmm. like physically on the streets and that sort of thing. You want to do a really interesting uh, exploration of community development? Because it was pr a little bit prior to 911 when Giuliani took over. And Giuliani cleaned the place up. You know what one of the things they made a commitment on? This is little things, right? They said that no train would have graffiti on it. They made an all-out commitment to clean up the subways. They arrested everybody for petty crime. Everybody. Took over. Because yeah. he said... We're going to change the perception. And petty crime in the subways gives the perception that things are unsafe. Trains would come into the depot at the end of the night, and they would have crews that would literally scrub all of the trains clean. Now, even though by the end of the day, they'd be graffitied again, but they would scrub all the trains clean and repaint them if necessary. So that when I, a New Yorker, walked into the subway, the trains were clean. They made an all-out commitment to no broken windows in public spaces. No broken windows. The, the window had to be repaired within 12 hours. So that the next day when you saw the window, it was repaired. And that's how they started to spin the, the people's pride in New York. I live in, a, I live in a shithole, excuse my language. I live in a great place. We took that strategy and when we opened the elementary school for homeless kids down in the States, we decided in a very dilapidated area to put awnings on all the windows. Awnings. <coughs> on every window. I remember arguing with my wife, who is the Minister of Finance in our organization. I remember arguing with Gina about the awnings. I can't believe we're spending $9,000 on awnings. What about books? Don't we need books? And I just kept bringing her back to pride. I want the kids to walk in the building and be proud. You walk in the gym, there was glass backboards all the way around. In the most challenged neighborhood, glass backboards all the way around. I wanted them to take pride. And I remember a little kid, six years old, LeVar, and I remember him saying, Mom, I'm proud of my school. Would you agree with me? He's probably going to come to school if he's proud of his school. You think he's going he's to wear that logo of his school shirt? He's going to do that. Pride. So what we're going to talk about, not next week, but the following week, what we're going to talk about is pride. How do I build pride in another human being and in a community or in an organization? I think it's a, it can be a strategy for community development. Pride. Okay. So somebody tell me something you're taking away from our hour and 20 minutes tonight. What are you taking away from tonight? What are you walking away with tonight? Whether it's Pericles, whether it's a code of conduct, whether it's this buy-in some, or something else, what are you taking away from tonight? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I look at the tools that you've given us to put us in that direction. We, I mean, this is like a tool. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <coughs> and, and, and I think that, or I hope that, you'll see how these things are progressively building on each other. It's a lot easier to have a code of conduct when you can manage your time. Mm -hmm. 
effectively. It's a lot easier to have a, a, an effective code of conduct when you're listening to other people. It's a lot easier to have an effective code of conduct when you know your personality and your style and your approach and you know that of others. Because you'll actually be able to deliver. If we, have done, if we had done code of conduct first, you would have gone out and said, I've got this new code of conduct. And all the people around you would have been like, well, that's great, but you're not doing any of it. Yeah, but this, this shows you, you can't get from A to B no. without doing the B, C. That's right. That's steps. Yeah. Somebody, somebody else, something you're taking away from tonight. Because of this program? Yeah. Good for you. And yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Woo! So the first thing I did when I went to the first meeting, um, within three days we went and faced the board and I got the volunteers to the program. Come on. And I got my working with the board meeting in place on behalf of our balance. And this Saturday we're having a piece of sale. Awesome! Connie! Woo! I had to tell you the truth. When, when Pam came to sign the preventive bulletin board down at the office, I nearly fainted from shock. Really? I've never heard the tell of a PTA in this town from the day I moved here. Yeah, and I just started to... I sit on there too. Yeah. You're on it too? The two of you? Yeah, Woo! <laughs> All right, so... Yeah, she up him. Okay, I want to ask you guys a question, and I'm asking on behalf of the rest of us, especially the people who aren't <laughs> physically in this community. What can the, what can we do to support the PTA? What can we do to help you? What do you need? And you don't have to answer that right now. If you if you know, tell us. No. And I'll tell you why. This is why this is important. New leadership, new energy, new excitement. We need to have some quick victories to reinforce your leadership. There's not a what? Why? Because they just don't have the funding to start doors in the bathroom stalls. And there's no doors in the bathrooms. And there's no running water in the, the water. Yeah, where they, they, where there's no water in their bathrooms? They don't have running water. So we're trying to find money to get the doors repaired. Well, Northland, they say they will be saying there's no money. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Everybody just stop. Just so I'm clear. So everyone else in this room of authority or with some influence is clear. So if I'm a young man and I walk into my into the washroom, there's no door. They can't use the washroom. Some of them will go into the bathroom. Yeah. They will wait. Or come home. Or come home from school. That's fucking ridiculous. So that's one of the issues that I was going to write a letter to the North Grand State Division um, and bring it up because you know where I work, I can start starting. Can you do this for me? <laughs> Okay, so instead of starting some, do me a favor. I want you to find out for me what it would cost to put in the walls or put in the stall and what it would cost to get the running water going. Yeah. And then what I would say is, and we'd have to get approval from Northlands, I bet you we've got enough skill in the town mm -hmm. or we could easily fly the skill up from Fort McMurray and we could get that fixed in about a day. Stop for a second. Let's step outside of the conversation and come back to pride. If you're a boy in grade three and you can't go to the bathroom at your school, how do you feel about you? You're important. You're valuable. You're our most important asset. And we love you so very much. Uh, I've got to hold it for seven hours. Incongruency and in say and do.
Yeah. So he knows he wants to think trying to baby children or children that are left home. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see So now why is it so important that all of us around the table, especially those of us that are not in, in this community, why is it so, so important that we help these emerging leaders solve this problem very quickly? Why, and we're, we're stepping out and using this as a learning experience. Why is it so important that we help this young emerging PTA and the... Set that, that's absolutely true, but I'm asking you to set that aside for just a second. I'm talking specifically within a leadership context. Why is it so important that all of us find a way to support these, the, the, the two of them and Pam? Set that aside. We all know that. I'm talking about in the context of leadership. Why is it so important that three leaders who are trying to make something happen, trying to get something done... They're going to build a reputation of getting things done and making things happen. They're going to show that they can make it happen. So the next time that Pam and these two stand up and say, we'd like to do this, the town goes, you know, those were the three ladies that got the bathrooms. Watch. This is exactly what happens. Those were the three ladies that got the bathrooms. I'll help them. Whereas before, they're just three crazy ladies. I don't know if they can do it. I'll hold back. I won't give them my time, talent, and treasure because I'm afraid it might lose. We've got to... That's right. That's right. We got, we got to go. We have to go, but you must listen to this concept. Anytime I'm trying to gain traction and turn things around, and, and you could speak to this probably better than me. It's a three-block war concept. I suppress the bad actor. I stabilize. I develop. Same is true with taking over as a leader. I suppress the negativity. I quickly as, as stabilize the situation, and I get the fastest victory I can possibly get to prove my own credibility as a leader. And then the reasonable people who've been hanging on the sideline, they come out of the shadows. Because now they say, it's okay. Somebody's actually going to win. They hang back to see. They're, in, they're hopeful, but they're going to hang back. Because when you take a fall, they don't want to take it with you. So that's why it's important for all of us to make sure that within the next three weeks, we get some stalls. Mm -hmm. So do me a favor. Do me a favor. Find out... <coughs> what exactly we have to do to get those stalls and get the water running. Find that out. And then we will try to see if we can support you in that. And whether that's money or skill or materials, I can guarantee you we all know somebody, we can make one phone call or two phone calls and get those items that you need. And I'm sure you have the skill in the community to install them. But I think every one of us in the room would agree that just hearing that story is unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. Yes, sir. But we might not address it. If the school wasn't built, there's no stalls involved. Right. We have to find out why there's no stalls. And then, so it doesn't make sense to replace them on a continuing basis. And it should be done once just for the victory. But if there are other elements associated, like do the girls have walls? The girls appear to have a door in the bathroom. No. They don't the have girls a door. Have stalls. Like the entrance into the bathroom? There's no door. There's no was there a door at one time? Yes, there was doors, doors and then doors one time. they said they were going to fix it once in a row and they never the did. Water. That's what they said. Yeah, and the same, the same is true with the water. Like, why is there no water? So yeah, I get it running. Well, 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 I'll tell you right now. Stop for just a second. Plan. Let's just sign this off real quick because this is just, and we'll get to it. Hey, everybody, we're going to, wrap up the conversation from the video standpoint and you can talk to the ladies on the PTA to find out more. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs>